Good morning, good morning everyone and welcome to the fourth Energy Professionals Roundtable. We are more than delighted to have you here this morning and we appreciate your time for coming and joining this session this morning. But before we move forward, I would love to know where you're joining us from. Kindly put on the chat and let us know where you're joining us from this morning. It's morning from East Africa, so let us know where you're joining us from this morning. Kindly put on the chat, put on the chat. Let me see people energized and let, let me know where you are joining us from this morning. Good morning, Kitonga. Yes, I can see Elvis from Uganda, Chris Mbori from Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome, welcome. I can see Linda from Kenya. Thank you very much for joining us. Manuel from Uganda. I can see Uganda, Kampala, Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We appreciate you for finding time to join this session. So I would love to outline some housekeeping rules. Yes, I can see Pauline from Nairobi. Thank you, thank you very much. Uganda, Kampala, thank you for joining us. Nicholas from Kenya, thank you, thank you. I will, I will like to outline some housekeeping rules that we will abide to, to have a seamless and successful meeting this morning. I will ask that you stay muted until you, unless you're called upon to speak. In case of any questions, we'll have a session on question and answer, and you will be able to speak. You can use the raise up button, or you can use the chat and we will bring that to the attention of the speaker. My name is Emily Gitonga, and I'm so happy to be here this morning. I'm a member of the World Energy Day Secretariat and uh, your moderator for the day. So I will ask us to stay put because we have amazing, amazing uh, speakers lined up for you this morning. And I uh, will give a brief history on World Energy Day. World Energy Day is a celebration that is celebrated every 22nd of October. And in Kenya, the celebrations are being championed by the World Energy Day Foundation in collaboration with different partners from the year 2016. We've had amazing, amazing conferences that have happened, very successful conferences that have brought speakers from across the globe. Uh, we have different activities that run up in the run up for the World Energy Day celebrations. These activities include the Youth Innovation Challenge that seek to recognize great innovations from among the young people across East Africa and uh, different, uh, youth, uh, different youth participate in this in these challenge and they, they, the winning project get to win grad, grad prizes. We also have Energy Professionals Awards that recognizes the efforts of East African champions in the energy space. We also have, we have a lined up series of webinars that run up in the, in the run up for the World Energy Day with different conversations that take place across the year. We have Twitter chats, we have FB lives, and uh, today, we have a, an amazing, amazing, amazing panel lined up for you. And um, what is then different for the World Energy, Day, World Energy Day 2021? World Energy Day 2021 is going regional. This year, for the very first time, we are adding to the Pearl of Africa, Kampala, Uganda. We are hoping that uh, the world will open up and we will I have a physical meeting in Kampala, Uganda this year, and we have partners that we have partnered with this year. We have UNREA, that stands for Uganda National Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Alliance. We have Aria Finergy also, and uh, we look forward to a great and a great event this year. We recognize our partners in the room, UNREA and, and Aria Finergy, thank you very much for coming in and having to join us this day. Moving forward to the topic of the day. 
Our theme this year is on energy sustainability in Africa. Unlocking food sustainability, climate change, and water equation. But our topic for today is on energy policy and regulations. What emerging considerations are there for resilience and sustainability? We have great, great speakers, and I would love to mention why this topic is, is very relevant for us as energy professionals today. Sustainable energy needs, needs sustainable policies. And uh, by year 2030, the United Nations hopes that there will be universal access to modern energy. And this can only be achieved by by having conversations around energy policies, sustainable energy policies, having draft, we as energy professionals being involved in drafting policies that are sustainable for energy sustainability. So I will move on and introduce to you today an amazing speaker for us. Our first speaker today is joining us from Kampala, Uganda. And as I mentioned earlier, we are going we are going regional this year. So our speaker today, Rachel Nalule, is an energy policy advisor. She's currently working in GRZ for Motion and Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Program. She's a qualified environmentalist and holds a master's degree in environment and natural resources with a bias in energy policy from Makerere University. Rachel has more than five years experience in policy work and have helped in coordinating and reviewing or set out strategic documents and policies where she has partnered with the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development in conducting research studies. Her expertise and experience in matters energy policy makes her the best fit to tackle the topic today. So without further ado, I would love to welcome Rachel to take over the stage. Thank you. Welcome very much. Welcome, Rachel. Take the stage. Um, thank you so much, Emily. And uh, good morning to you all once again. Like uh, she has already mentioned, uh, my name is Rachel Nadole, and I work with uh, GIZ Prep. I'll just go straight. Uh, we have our presentation outline as having um, the background. I will just give a background, um, a small introduction to, the, to that. And then we talk of the scope of the energy sector, the key issues in the sector, the policy framework for Uganda and our regulatory framework also in the presentation. So for the background, uh, we know that uh, the energy sector is a major contributor to the national development and uh, its linkages to other uh, sectors. Definitely we, we see the performance of energy also impacts on the performance of other sectors. The other sectors, of course, uh, rely also on energy, like uh, the health sector, education sector, uh, water, and, uh, and, and transport, among others. So uh, energy itself underpins the economic development together with the sustainable uh, development uh, goals and the 2030 SDGs. And I'm glad that, of course, even this meeting or this uh, gathering, the discussions are going to talk about sustainability, definitely, which is also about sustainable uh, development. So the sustainable energy uh, uh, policies uh, can always be associated with the use of energy without necessarily endangering the ability of the future generations to meet uh, their own needs. And for Uganda, our energy policy is uh, recognized by our constitution uh, where the energy policy, not only a constitutional requirement, but also um, for the facilitation of uh, government's major programs like the National Development Plan 3 and the Vision 2040. We now have the, the, the NDP 3 already operational 
And uh, for your information, uh, we have shifted from the sector approach to program uh, based approach. And we have a sustainable energy development program from, from, the, from, from the sustainable energy development program as one of the programs earmarked for implementation in our NDP3. Uh, maybe just a brief on the, on the goal of our sustainable energy development program is, is to meet the energy needs of the country by providing adequate and affordable, clean and reliable energy for the sustainable socioeconomic growth and, and the development so uh, that is hinged into uh, that. The, uh, the scope of the energy sector in Uganda, we have uh, five, six uh, subsectors, which, 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 um, which are in the entire sector, and that includes the power subsector, um, having generation transmission and distribution for protection. Then the, petro the petroleum subsector, which uh, includes oil and gas, the petroleum supply and distribution. We have the, renew the, the new and renewable sources of energy. Uh, those, that entails biomass, the small hydro, solar, wind, and thermal. We have the atomic energy subsector, uh, which um, includes uh, nuclear for power production but also the energy efficiency, which is a cross-cutting issue for all uh, forms of energy. So what are the key issues in the power subsector? For, uh, from, for, from Uganda, uh, we have uh, a number of issues, but the major ones uh, uh, that are broadly explained here include the low level of electrification access that apparently stands at 51%, where we have only 24% uh, access to the grid, that is the main uh, national grid. So the sector is also uh, constrained by the transmission and distribution and network not being able to absorb the, 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 the present and planned generated capacity in the medium term. The poor, <clears throat> the poor power reli reliability of course, this uh, impacts on the productivity of uh, industrial sector. If power, we have power shortages on and off, definitely the industrial sector gets affected in terms of um, their economic uh, work. The uncoordinated planning of projects and uh, um, instances where we have uh, substandard sections of the network affects um, the power subsector and definitely access to the energy. The other issue is uh, the delayed implementation of projects. Sometimes this is um, also as a result of a number of uh, issues, say for example, maybe uh, procurement processes, the bureaucracy, the funds. Um, if uh, there are no uh, funds or uh, other requirements that are needed to implement the project, the feasibility studies, this delays the implementation of projects. And of course, um, you find that maybe even uh, that leads to um, low levels or even delayed access to the power to electricity. Difficulty in acquisition of land and way and way leads for the construction of um, infrastructure development. This um when we talk of the acquisition of land so uh when land is acquired sometimes um the compensation processes or procedures can also be an issue which also leads to which can also be an issue in the sector the other one uh, as identified is the low level of energy efficiency in the utilization of of energy so those, were, those are some of the key issues in the sector that uh, we are faced um, as Uganda. Then I'll go to the, our policy framework. So what is uh, Uganda's policy framework like? So we, we see that the sector has been already guided by the energy policy of uh, 20, 2002 
And uh, the goal of the policy uh, is to meet the energy needs of Uganda population for social and economic development in an environmentally sustainable manner. And the policy objectives to that note, one of them is um, to establish the availability, potential and demand of the various energy resources in the country. At that time, uh, th this, uh, this objective, I think, uh, was, uh, uh, came as a result of um, the realization that uh, there are a number of uh, energy resources, but uh, their potential had not yet uh, been established. And um, a few studies then needed to be done and find out the potential where uh, government then decided to have this as an objective, such that uh, these resources can be they can be developed. The other objective was to increase access to modern, afford, to, more, to modern, affordable and reliable energy services as a contribution to the poverty eradication. And here we have, um, we have uh, programs like for, uh, that are promoting rural electrification that came in to increase access. Uh, third objective is to improve energy governance and administration stimulate economic development, and lastly, to manage the energy-related environmental impacts. Uh, we also have the Renewable Energy Policy of 2007, whose goal is to increase the use of modern renewable energy from, from that percentage to 61% of the total energy consumption uh, by uh, the year 2017. Of course, uh, when you look at it, this policy is also a little bit old, so there is a need for review onto that. The main features for this policy um, to, in, uh, in, to introduce uh, the feed uh, this has to do with attraction of private sector investment. And um, uh, the second feature is standardized uh, power purchase agreements, uh, where we, where this, when you look at it from the other point of view, is that at least it, it cuts short on the time spent in, in trying to negotiate on these agreements. So this standardized power agreement, it's just a matter of uh, filling in and then uh, agreeing without uh, wasting a lot of time. The third future is obligation of fossil fuel companies to mix uh, products with the biofuels up to uh, 20%. And we have the Biofuels Act already. Uh, then the tax incentives on renewable energy technologies was also, is also one of the futures for this uh, policy. So, after the, 20, after the 2002 energy policy, um, the country embarked on, the ministry embarked on revising um, that policy. And apparently we now have uh, the draft, the revised draft uh, for 2020. And this uh, um, has been the primary uh, guiding document for the country's energy sector. The, the 2002 energy policy. It is actually still the one um, uh, in, in operation since this one is still in draft form. So it's not yet operational. And the review was basically necessary due to the changes in the sector and emerging issues. Like uh, we have a lot of uh, issues as highlighted above, but also issues to do with the uh, population growth and all the, the rest. So led to the revision of uh, this uh, policy. The overall objective uh, of the revised policy is to facilitate uh, the provision of affordable, reliable, and adequate energy uh, to meet the economic and social needs of Uganda's population in an environmentally sustainable manner. So what are the specific objectives of uh, this policy? Uh, one of them, it has a number of them, and uh, one of them is to increase access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services, uh, stimulate economic development, 
improve the security and reliability of energy supply to manage uh, environmental impacts of energy exploitation and consumption, uh, promote the efficiency and conservation in energy supply and utilization, but also improve uh, energy sector governance, issues of capacity building and integrated planning. Um, the other one is uh, promotion of renewable and alternative energy sources, as well as raising public awareness on energy resources, services, and programs. Um, so under the policy framework, we still have a policy on decentralized renewable energy. And here, what, we, uh, what do we mean? Uh, the government of Uganda is uh, promoting the mini grids in, in, in places that are far from the main grid and have high demand with potential for productive use of electricity. And for this, the government has already identified 600 mini grid sites which have the potential to connect over 80,000 households and businesses in rural areas where it is uh, uh, not economically feasible to extend the grid. At least here, well, uh, this policy also uh, allows uh, other, other, other people to access uh, energy and uh, this definitely uh, uh, enhances or the development and businesses economically. Um, most of the identified mini grids uh, will be uh, developed through the PPP arrangements with the private sector developers selected through a revised uh, auction. So here private sector then comes in to play and then the government uh, has to finance the distribution grid, the consumer connections and provide subsidies uh, on the mini grid generation such that um, that the, 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 the tariff is lowered a little bit. To that, uh, we still have the electricity connection policy of 2018 as um, the policy uh, aims at addressing uh, challenges that have hindered uh, access to electricity in the country. So the goal of this policy is to achieve a national coverage to electricity of 60%, at least by 2027, if we can achieve that. And it has two major objectives, which one of them is uh, increasing the number of connections uh, made annually from the current average uh, 70,000 to, uh, to, to 300 connections. And then also increasing electricity demand on the main grid by 500 megawatts uh, by the year 2027. 20, so we still have some years, though not so many, to achieve that. Um, so what are the strategies to achieve the, the policy objectives? One of them, uh, what we looked at, um, was the subsidizing the connection charges for eligible customers existing within the voltage distribution and network. And also undertaking a grid, grid densification and intensification, prioritizing the areas to be <coughs> having the potential for creating demand while ensuring equitable provision of services just uh, across um, the country. The others uh, include the uh, introduction of uh, technical standards and low cost technologies for wiring and connection and connection purposes, but also uh, have in place a mechanism that enables customers uh, pay their contribution to the connection cost over a period of time. Uh, enhancing the capacity of service providers to meet uh, the increased connection targets, materials, uh, capacity building, and of course, institutional strengthening also go hand in hand with uh, that. We have the power sector reform policy of 1999, and this, uh, this, this uh, came out through a wide consultation during those years, and the policy 
objectives uh, uh, include uh, the increased investment in the power sector, to also increase financial and operational efficiency in the sector, increase uh, access to affordable electricity services, and also improve on the energy governance and administration. And when this policy came into place, it result also resulted into the Electricity Act of uh, 1999. And that is part of our regulatory framework. So this uh, act has also its features. And uh, these include, uh, uh, there are a number of them, the, liber the liberalization of uh, the electricity in the, in the industry, the unbundling of the Uganda Electricity Board, uh, which came into, which, which, which was divided into three uh, entities, the generation, U, UEGCL, the transmission and the distribution. But also it has the establishment of ERA that regulates our sector. Uh, the other future is establishment of the Rural Electrification Fund uh, with the main objective of enhancing rural, rural access to electricity. And then the other is establishment of the Electricity Dispute, Dispute Tribunal that has a jurisdiction to hear and determine electricity sector disputes, which are referred to it. Further, um, our, uh, the regulations of the power subsector uh, are always done by ERA, which is our Electricity Regulatory Authority, uh, whose role basically includes the issuing of permits and licenses, uh, issuing of uh, distribution licenses, setting and reviewing of power tariffs, as well as monitoring terms of concessions and licensing. So um, uh, then we have uh, measures uh, in the legal framework that uh, we need to improve for electricity sector. And one of them is that act of 1999, which apparently is under revision to, uh, to address some of the challenges uh, in the legal framework, but also as a sector, um, uh, as, as a sector is moving on. Then our plans are also underway to put in place uh, an energy efficiency and energy conservation law, which we hope will promote and regulate the efficient utilization of uh, energy in the country. So to that note, I would like to come to the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening in. Uh, that is the Ugandan uh, perspective. Um, Back to you, moderator, Emily. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Rachel, for that insightful, insightful conversation there. And we have noted different years, energy policies in Uganda. In 2002, in 2007, where they are Sorry for that. I was saying thank you very much, Rachel Nalule, for that great, great presentation that you've shared with us today. We have seen different energy policies in Uganda from the year 2002 to the acts that have been there from the year 1999. We have seen uh, different uh, frameworks that we, ha we have in place for the, to, to achieve the sustainable agenda that we are talking about today. So before we go to the question and uh, question session, I would love to recognize our partner. I can see Julie in the house, Julie from Maria. I would love to welcome you. As people share, share their questions on the chat, I would love to welcome you and say something, and then we can proceed to the question session. Julie? Julie Kusimba, if you can hear me, you can say something, or if she's not uh, still in the room, we can progress. And I will ask Ruth, who is our chat master, to share with us a poll that we will take, and then we will take the questions. Julie? 
he has the poll ready. Karen, kindly share the poll. Yeah, I have launched the poll. Okay, we have, we have the poll on our screens. Where do the proposed regulations have the biggest impact? Is it government related bodies, residential energy consumers, industrial or commercial energy com consumers, untitled energy products and services companies? Please just take the poll and let us see what you think about this question. As we do this, kindly put your questions for Miss Rachel on the chat and we'll get to get her answer those questions for you. We'll have two minutes to take the poll. Going once, going twice. Can we close the poll now? All right, all right, all right. We then let us share the, the answers to the poll and let us see what people in the house are thinking about this question. So 80% of the people say industrial or commercial energy consumers is where proposed regulation have the biggest impact. And then we have 37% on residential energy consumers. We have government related bodies at 26% and untitled energy product and service companies at 14%. So, okay, we see. So industry and commercial energy consumers has the highest at 80%. So we can see Julie is now ready to speak to us. Kylie, welcome and say something. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today and thank you all for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure to partner with UNREA and Innovators and have us discuss such um, insightful topics and help us to grow the energy sector. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Thank you, thank you very much, Julie, for welcoming people on the webinar today. And I can see people saying on the chat, thank you, Rachel, for the presentation. What is the status? And the question is, what is the status of the review of the Electricity Act 1999? Rachel, if you can tell, if you can take that question, what is the status of the review of the Electricity Act 1999? Uh Right. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, the, the, the review is actually ongoing and it has uh, just uh, started, uh, but uh, it's, it's not yet is ongoing. All right, all right. I hope that answers the question. And uh, I had also questions that were shared with us earlier by the audience. And there's a question of what policies can Uganda adapt from the region to help the gap in, to help reduce the gap in reaching the sustainability agenda? I will repeat that again. What policies can Uganda adapt from the region to help reduce the gap in reaching sustainability? Ms. Rachel? Ms. Rachel, are you there? Hello? All right, as we wait, As we wait for the 
for our speaker, Ms. Rachel, to respond to that. I, I was asking what policies can Uganda adapt from the region to help reduce the gap in reaching sustainability? Ms. Rachel? Seems we have lost Miss Rachel, and when she comes back, she'll be able to tackle that question. Let me proceed and say that uh, our presentations and our previous webinars are available on our social media. And those will also urge you to uh, to join our WhatsApp broadcast, where we'll, you will be able to receive updates from different activities on World Energy Day. I will ask our chat master to put the link on the chat box and we can be able to plug into that. When our speaker is back, she will be able to take the questions. Uh, it seems she has uh, difficulties with uh, audio because I can not be able to get her. And when she's, she's back, we will be able to take the questions that you pose for her on the chat. And so let me just proceed and uh, talk about uh, an energy program that is going on, the Youth in Energy Empowerment Program. This is a program that is championed by energy by Innovators Limited, partnering with GIZ in the Wheat for Food program. We have 10 cohorts already that are en en enrolled in this program and they have been able to be taught a essential skills and uh, energy management uh, program. And we have one of them, Cheryl, who is with us today, and I would love her to say something, and then we can proceed and take the questions as our speaker is is is, is preparing us for the questions that we have put out for her. Cheryl, are you in the building? Can we hear you? Yes, yeah, she is in the in the internship program, and that's why she is in honor attires. Can you just give us an experience of what the program has been like for you? Okay, hi everyone. As uh, Emily has introduced me, I'm Cheryl Shilibwa, and I'm one of the beneficiaries of the YIP program. Uh, the YIP program has been uh, so empowering for me so far, and I believe it is even for my colleagues. I have learned so much in terms of uh, energy management. Uh, right now, we are on the ground at uh, different sites. I feel confident after the training we received and every day has been a learning experience. Uh, we've also had uh, some in-person trainings with uh, innovators in between. Uh, we still get um, the essential skills training. We get support from innovators and uh, it's been a great experience. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it so far. And uh, even being part of this um, round table discussions has built me as a, as a person. I, I, I'm getting knowledge on what is going on in Africa and uh, the direction we are taking towards uh, sustainability in energy. So indeed, it's been quite empowering every day. I look forward to what lies ahead and I'm loving it. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, Sherry, for sharing that. We will proceed and uh, have our second speaker. All the questions that we are, you have put on the chat, I can see them. Our speakers will take these questions after the second speaker has spoken. So our second speaker is Dr. Engineer Fenwix, and we have a doctor in the building, a doctor of engineering. So our, <laughs> our speakers for today uh, I will introduce him to you. Fenwix uh, is um, Senior Energy Efficiency Officer at EPRA Kenya. He has over 10 years of experience 
in energy efficiency and renewable energy fields. Phoenix holds a PhD and a master's degree in energy technology. He is the right speaker for us today, and I can go on and on and read his bio and bio. I have a full, full, full bio for him here, and he is the right person for us today. He's going to talk to us, and I will welcome F Dr. Engineer Fenwick to talk to us today. Welcome, welcome so much, Engineer Fenwick. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, maybe by, by, by nodding, you'll uh, tell me if you are, you are getting me clearly. Okay, fine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, um, as she said, I'm Musonye. I work for EPRA. Uh, EPRA is the energy regulator of Kenya. Uh, when uh, she was asking me to test my presentation in the morning, I told her I will be doing a lecture. I won't be making a presentation. So today, I just wanted us to share <clears throat> some uh, insights, of course, in terms of uh, energy policy and regulations, uh, emerging considerations for resilience and sustainability in the Kenyan perspective. I, I, I sometimes consider uh, maybe just having a nice talk, a better way of presenting uh, uh, issues. Other times I do slides, of course, when I'm doing presentations, maybe in uh, uh, other areas like in class. So uh, I, I will take a bit of a, a different approach. Uh, the first thing I'll, I'll, I'll look at uh, and I know my time is 20 minutes. I hope I will uh, <clears throat> adhere to that. Uh, why do we talk about sustainability? Uh, what drives governments to think about sustainability? Why does innovators uh, hold these sessions? Eh? It's because of two issues. Of course, you're talking of energy as a public good. Eh? So every government has a responsibility of ensuring that every Kenyan has access to uh, sustainable energy uh, in terms of sustainability when you talk sustainable energy we are talking of of course uh, uh they are we call them uh, the the triangle uh goals uh, of energy uh, the first uh, bit at the tip of the triangle is uh, competitiveness when you are saying that we're talking about energy uh we're having a triangle this way so on top is competitiveness uh the government uh, energy as being a public good then the government is supposed to ensure that uh, all the citizens get uh, energy in a competitive way. Uh, of course, competitiveness talks about price. I need to get uh, value for my money. I should not be overcharged. Uh, two, uh, the energy needs to be of quality. That's what we talk about uh, uh, um, value for money. Then, of course, it's supposed to be reliable. Uh, I should not be using power right now. Then the next two minutes, the power goes off. If you have had experience working with the people from uh, our neighbors from South Africa, sometimes you might realize uh, a speaker uh, says he won't be there in the afternoon because uh, ESCOM will be, uh, will be doing power rationing. So that brings those issues of compet competitiveness. We need the uh, energy has to be quality. It has to be at a, an affordable price. Then of course it has to be reliable. It has to come that. And then you see most of the times when we talk about uh, these issues of energy, we we tend to focus on the consumers and forget the suppliers. If the suppliers are not there, then you can't get the energy. And the energy market is very difficult to penetrate because of what you call natural monopoly. It's, it's expensive to start uh, energy projects. So most of the times uh, when you talk about uh, sustainability, it has to cut both ends, the ends of the demand side and the supply side. Supply side, the, the, the uh, entities, the business entities in the energy must make profits because they're not in the business for a charity. And then as even as they make profits, they must be reasonable. Uh, the energy must be safe. The energy must be competitive. And there has to be security of supply. So in terms of security of supply, because I've talked of a triangle, I've talked of uh, competitiveness, all the things I've been talking about. Then I've, I've talked about safety. That's the second uh, edge of the triangle. Safety and environment. That's the second edge of the triangle. So that uh, when we are supplying our energy, the energy has to be safe and it, has, it should not jeopardize our environment. The environment should not be altered in a significant way. Then the third uh, uh, age of the triangle, we're talking about uh, uh, security of supply. Security of supply. I will still go back to ESCOM, our uh, cousin in South Africa, where you find uh, because of probably poor planning of how much power you're supposed to take on your grid, eh? 
it's uh, you you at some stage you don't have power uh, because you didn't plan well. That can still happen in terms of petroleum. Huh? When you want to import petroleum and you've not uh, done your statistics well, you haven't uh, collected data on consumption uh, and, and done very nice projections, you might import half of what is required. So mid-month, there is no uh, petroleum. And uh, the next shipment is at, uh, at the, the port in the Gulf region. So you see the economy stops. And now we understand from these three uh, policy triangles, uh, the, the three uh, policy goals, or the, the, the three, the, the triangle goal, from there, you understand why the government has to come in with policies and regulations. <coughs> Although, of course, uh, I, I wouldn't want to fault uh, uh, the, the title when you talk about policy and regulations, but a regulation is a child of a policy. So when you talk of a policy, regulations are instruments of implementing policies. Eh? The same way we also have acts, we have standards, uh, all those are instruments now we use to implement policy. So we're, we're, um, as the theme of this uh, discussion today, of course, you now have to, have to look at the way policy and the uh, attendant uh, policy tools uh, assist in ensuring that we have competitiveness in the energy field, that we have security of supply in the energy field, that we have safety and environmental considerations uh, being uh, in the energy field. So uh, resilience is built around these three issues, actually. Competitiveness, security of supply, safety, and environment. If you don't meet it, all these three goals, eh, and of course need to do perfect balance, then uh, uh, the, the policy uh, sometimes becomes faulty, so it has to be changed. Uh, so in Kenya, uh, when, when you're looking at policies, uh, the question is, how do you implement policy? Uh, what are the tools that you use to implement policy? Uh, and of course, there, there are three uh, approaches we use to policy in Kenya and all over the world. Uh, the, the first tool is uh, we give them uh, mnemonics. You, you, the first tool is uh, summons, a summon uh, those who go to church. You see the pastor uh, giving summons. So the summon on the mountain, if you, you read the Bible. So uh, th that tool is also useful in the energy sector where we use uh, summons or tambourines. A tambourine is this thing people play in church. It's, it's a tambourine. So if you want to enhance uh, uh, sustainability, the energy policies in the country provide for that. Uh, like you see right now, we are talking in this round table meeting. It's part of summons, eh? where you're talking to people just to understand issues. You're not using any threat. You're not using any stick. And you're not using any carrots. Like you're not telling them, do this, I'll pay you this. So that's a summon. And it's one of the ways, of course, you approach policies. Uh, in the, in the world, eh? not necessarily in Kenya, but all over. So whenever you're making policy instruments, that has to be part of it. Uh, you hinge it somewhere. If you read any policy tool, you'll see it there. Uh, uh, if you come to EPR and see the way we do our things, you'll find we, we, we list, we line lots of workshops around the countries, eh? around the country. It's not that we're going to sell our name there. We are going, we're now uh, using the tambourine uh, section. And of course, you have the sticks. Sticks, the ones you use to whip a horse. Uh, jail terms, fines, and everything. Then we have carrots. So we have carrots, you have sticks, you have tambourines, those three. Any policy instrument must always adhere to those three. It's either addressing, you know, uh, it's addressing any of those three. It's either saying how you're going to get the carrots or how they're going to punish you if you don't meet certain uh, regulations or how they're going to uh, try to uh, uh, pro proliferate the energy, sustainable energy knowledge. So in, in Kenya, I will. Uh, I will now highlight some of the things we use. And most of these things are sticks, eh? uh, uh, carrots, most of the times. Energy sector is uh, really known for uh, uh, being as tough as uh, a KRA. So uh, that's why it's easy even for uh, our partners here, uh, innovators, to look for us in the PRA and say we have a meeting come. I'm not sure if they can call KRA to their meeting eh? because KRA will start counting the number of people who are attending and start thinking they are paid. So you see, m most of the instruments we use uh, here are carrots than sticks. Uh, I, I, I'll go straight and I'm not going to be specific on any specific technology, but I'll look at the Energy Act as a, 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 a policy instrument. Now from the Energy Act, you will make regulations. Eh? So the Energy Act of 2019 is used to enhance or to implement the aspirations of the energy policy of 2018 
and the energy policy of 2004. So uh, it, it depends actually uh, how you look at it. Uh, sometimes you'll be told that the energy policy of 2018 is no longer, is not operational, but it's there in the website, so you can still uh, uh, see it. Then of course, there's the early energy policy of uh, 2004. But from these policies, you make acts, an energy act, which tries to uh, elaborate further on the aspirations of the policy. Then from the act, you make regulations, which are fine-tuned fine, fine -tuned details eh, of how now the act will be implemented. Then still even from the regulations, now we will make uh, uh, procedures, internal procedures and guidelines and rules, which you now use to operationalize the regulation. So you see, as you can scale down from the policy, you have instruments as you go down. So also from the policy, of course, we have uh, standards, eh? which you also uh, work uh, hand in hand with the regulations and they go together. So uh, I will mention some of the uh, things we look at. Uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the newest uh, kid on the block has been the mini grid regulations, which uh, EPR is trying to, uh, 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 to publish, of course, through the Ministry of Energy and through the AG. So uh, these regulations, of course, uh, there, was, there was a time uh, uh, mini grids became uh, a, a viable solution to underserve the areas in this country where there are no, there is no grid. So we found there were lots of people doing mini grids here and there. And of course, uh, before you come up with any regulation, you must identify a problem. So a potential problem was identified eh, that uh, there could be issues with the uh, mini grids in the future. One is because Kenya Power will come there at, at some stage and uh, normally the grid power is cheaper than mini grid power. So if Kenya Power comes there and people want to connect to the grid, what will happen and mini grid has their, their network in that area, what happens? And the government considers uh, electricity a public good. So these regulations will be trying to uh, sort out those issues of what happens when the grid comes there, uh, how we will be getting this, uh, 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 the clearances and everything. As of now, we just have guidelines which we use for mini grids, but these regulations are going to be of use. As from the Energy Act, there is also uh, the net metering regulations. The, what do these ones try to solve mm -hmm. in the country? It's one because uh, it was realized uh, uh, people might want to install their own renewable energy systems uh, on, on, their, on their buildings on their facilities, then of course, most of the systems are non-dispatchable. So at some times you'll find that you may not generate uh, if you're using uh, mostly solar, you may want to store your energy. And uh, you know, if you increase or include the storage component of uh, uh, the system to solar, the cost becomes very high. So the concept of net metering is there to assist in that con con context that I, I, I put, I, I have my own, uh, facility. I have my renewable energy source, uh, mostly non-dispatchable. Then I can dispatch uh, the excess uh, to the grid eh, as a form of uh, storage. So that I don't have batteries, but I can just store the grid Then the grid gives me back the following day. And then at the end of the month, of course, we net, we net, we get the difference. So if I have positive from the grid, I pay them the positive, but the grid will not, never pay you if you have, they have the positive from you. Uh, of course, there are other net metering uh, arrangements in uh, other jurisdictions where you, you pay, but uh, uh, in this context, the concept of net metering was supposed to assist people to bank energy to the grid, not to sell. So at the moment, it's about banking. Uh, it's a no cash exchange. Uh, but of course, in the future, when need be, uh, then uh, maybe Kenyan Power has issues with the, uh, they don't have enough power. Now, now probably they might start to, uh, uh, selling. We're also looking at FIT. Uh, FIT, the, the last one you had in Kenya was in 2012. Uh, mm, it was useful in a way to encourage people to sell uh, renewable energy power to the grid. Eh? Although uh, if you read, read literature, uh, you'll find that the cost of energy has been, uh, the, the cost of those components, mostly for solar, has been uh, reducing. Eh? Uh, one, because uh, of course there was a production glut uh, in China at some stage, I think it was 2010, around 2014. 
uh, because Germany had a, a lot of demand for those panels. So that glut came there and the, 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 the cost of uh, panels has been going low with the time. Eh? So at some stage, uh, the FIT uh, rates have to be, of course, revised because as, as, as it is now, uh, they, they, are to, they are looking at it in terms of the 2012 thinking eh? where their costs could have been high by then, but now the cost should have reduced because of these components. So that, that of course, that uh, 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 has to be revised in the new, if, if any, any other FIT policy comes in. But uh, the, the best way, because you see uh, sometimes when you have these structures in place, they are, they are amenable to manipulation, mostly maybe by power brokers and everything. So uh, there's the energy auction uh, uh, concept which might be developed. I, I would not want to commit myself to that, but the energy auction concept might be developed. Then when you develop the concept, uh, it will be easy for the government now to float tenders for people who want to supply energy at a competitive rate. Uh, recall on our triangle, we're talking about competition at the, at the apex of the triangle. So uh, you may not want someone to double charge you. Uh, the, 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 the auctions will be helpful in, in that uh, context. Of course, the Energy Act uh, also has other issues like uh, power willing. When you talk power willing is now, it's easy for people to produce their own electricity from this end, like where I'm sitting. Then they sell it somewhere uh, close to my uh, home in Kamega. Kamega is just close to Uganda. Uh, it's, it's, it's easier to go to Kampala to come to Nairobi, by the way. So I, I can generate power here, then I sell to, uh, I use the existing infrastructure uh, for the national, uh, uh, the national uh, off taker, then I take it to Western, then I pay them some money. So you're doing power wheeling, which is also, it, um, it will be uh, made operational uh, after all the instruments for the act will be working. Of course, there'll also be independent network operator. Uh, the, the concept of an independent network operator is uh, to assist in terms of reliability actually, because right now Kenya Power does everything. They, they transmit and they retail. So when you have someone to operate their network, it becomes easy for, for them. When you unbundle the sector, it becomes easy for them to uh, use this time to do other, other issues or other things. Then of course, there's the local content. Uh, we've always said, and most of the times when I meet this, uh, our partners from Europe and USA, we always tell them uh, the first thing you need to do, even after we've done everything you're supposed to do, you, you must make sure you do some training. Uh, why do we need training? Because uh, we may not want all the time when you want to uh, do complex stuff in this country uh, or even in Uganda uh, for that matter, we, we not want to get those people uh, uh, from abroad because one it becomes very expensive to do energy projects because uh, you want to uh, call uh, people from abroad, you pay for them, you come, you bring them here, you pay for their hotel very expensively. So there is a local content uh, requirements in the Energy Act which says that before you uh, install or start any business in Kenya for energy or even those projects, there has to be a specific percentage of the locals in that project and not just people, uh, we call what Wamukono, uh, the, uh, the manual people, no, but uh, there will be management, this percentage, mid-level management, this percentage, then of course the casual laborer, this percentage. So uh, that has to be uh, adhered to and we'll, we'll make local content regulations for that eh, to be a bit specific. Uh, when we started, I said uh, most of the times when we have a problem, uh, we, 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 when we, you have an act, you must have a regulation. So you see like the act talks about local content, but there are no regulations say specifically how that's going to be done. So we want to make regulations now to say who does what and when, and how do you do it? That's when what, what will be having local content. <clears throat> I'll talk about my pet subject, that is uh, ESCOS, Energy Service Companies. Uh, because we've been uh, talking about uh, renewable energy, uh, we have forgotten energy efficiency, which is uh, an important thing. Uh, that's the spring springboard. Uh, uh, that's the springboard that uh, 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 innovators uh, came into the energy field because of energy efficiency. So uh, we, we, the Energy Act also envisages uh, the use of uh, ESCOs, energy service companies, to do energy or to invest in energy efficiency field. And how are they going to do that? Uh, an ESCO, uh, an ESCO just comes to your facility, they evaluate your energy use, they see loopholes where you're supposed to improve. Then of course they go to the bank, they get money by themselves. 
then they install that project, they implement uh, the energy saving measures, then you measure the difference of what you would have used and what we are using. That difference becomes the money you pay them. So that's why it's called a, a ESCOS implement energy performance contracts. So the payment is basically based on the savings that you get, which is important. Uh, sustainability uh, uh, cannot uh, uh, stand if you don't talk about efficiency. We may have all uh, the proper sources of energy, we are renewable energy, but if you're misusing the energy, then of course that's not sustainable use. One, because it becomes expensive, renewable energy, even, even it's clean energy, but it's still expensive. So you want to improve on how you're using that uh, uh, kind of energy. The same thing with the uh, efficiency, we are talking about uh, standards and labeling. Uh, standards and labeling in two ways. Uh, one, we are talking of uh, S and L, standards and labeling in clean cooking clean cooking uh s and l uh, mostly talk of, of improved biomass cook stoves there are some players uh that one uh, epra is not directly involved but we are there as advisors to uh improve biomass cook stoves ccak cook, clean cook stove association of kenya where they're making some uh, labeling uh on cook stoves so that cook stoves will be labeled in terms of efficiency then uh, people when they're buying those cook stoves, they can know this is this efficient. This is what it can produce in terms of uh, indoor air pollution because in terms of pollution, remember I talked about environment as one of the triangles. So uh, the policy here uh, is, uh, and I advised uh, our our partners from CCK is we are using salmons and tambourines. So I told them one, uh, please uh, don't use the government logo on those things because when people see the government, they think the government wants to either whip them or take them to jail. So I told them the first thing is uh, uh, we will assist in drafting uh, things like uh, brochures uh, and from, um, uh, messages on how it's good to use uh, uh, improved biomass cook stoves. Then that will be uh, will assist in uh, uptaking of that uh, the the cook stoves. So uh, then we also have other appliances, of course, systems and labeling. Uh, we had a regulation called uh, the Energy Appliances Energy uh, Performance and Labeling Regulations of 20, 2016. Uh, these regulations uh, regulate, uh, if such a sentence is allowed, the regulations regulate the importation of uh, uh, specific appliances. In terms of, uh, we talk of refrigeration, we are talking about uh, uh, motors, we're talking about uh, lights, uh, that's a, a, a double cap for reason lamps, and compact for reason lamps. We are talking of air conditioners and we're talking about ballasts for lights. Those are six appliances. So we use those, uh, we regulate those appliances in terms of they are supposed to, uh, they are supposed to uh, actually improve. We talk about appliances to improve the performance, image performance of the, uh, the appliances. So once they are improved, uh, of course, someone has to go to the lab to test the appliances. After testing the appliances, uh, they should pass the minimum energy performance standards that have been put there. Once they pass the standards, then they are brought to uh, EPRA. When they are brought to EPRA, then uh, EPRA gives them the label. So if you go to uh, buy a fridge and you see that uh, label from EPRA, that's from standards and labeling uh, uh, program, which uh, uh, goes into sustainability. So what's the way forward, of course? Uh, as, as, uh, what are the future considerations? Uh, one is uh, ESCOS. We are going into ESCOS, that's the new field we, we need to look at. I know Innovators has been doing some training. Uh, I saw there was a topic on ESCOS. We, we're going into that direction eh? where, because uh, there's a problem with investment, probably there, there's no fund or the facilities, the players in the field do not have the expertise and the conviction to invest in energy efficiency. So ESCOS will come to bridge uh, that gap where they bring the expertise, they bring the money and they bring the conviction to do the work, that would be very, uh, that would be essential. Two, uh, we talk of uh, standards and labeling, we will improve by expanding our bracket of the appliances that are under this uh, regime of standards and labeling. So uh, that's going to improve. Uh, we have many appliances to make sure that uh, when you go anywhere to the shop to buy an appliance, it's not going to consume electricity uh, unreasonably. So uh, that we want to protect our uh, our citizens against uh, appliances that consume electricity in an unreasonable way. Then three, of course, we are going to power wheeling. 
uh, assisting people to generate power from wherever they are and trans uh, transporting it to other areas. Uh, four, uh, those are just policy considerations. Of course, uh, the power willing, we're talking about uh, net metering, where we're going to improve uh, uh, bankability of uh, our energy, renewable energy resources. Then five, uh, we are uh, talking about, of course, uh, FIT, and this one is in terms of uh, now the consumer. You see, FIT was looking at the producer, but now the consumer, the prices have to change uh, to ensure that they reflect the current market uh, rates eh? so that you don't come to me and sell me uh, 12 US cents per unit of a solar generated plant when it can be eight, mm -hmm. or you want to sell me 14 cents per unit of wind eh? when it has, the prices have reduced. So, uh, FIT, uh, that's going to uh, change. Then, of course, uh, I don't know if that is six or five, eh? I've lost my train of thought. We're talking about local content. Uh, we will make sure that uh, uh, any foreigner comes here, including Ugandans, by the way. If you come here to do work, we will ensure that uh, you, are, you employ the locals. Eh? Uh, and just from, uh, in terms of from the directors, directors to senior managers up to the uh, lower level, that's going to improve the skills uh, capacity building of our our uh, citizen. So uh, uh, um, with that, eh, I, I want to imagine, actually it's, uh, I've gone by four minutes more, um, sorry for that, but uh, that was uh, my uh, short, if that's short uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Emily. Thank you, thank you very much, Engineer Fenwick for that, for those amazing inputs. And I would love to mention that we were waiting for our second speaker who was on the flyer, Caroline, but he was represented by engineer very well, and we are very, very grateful for your presentation. I can see on the chat many, many questions are coming in for our speakers, and I noticed that Mr. James is uh, taking some of the questions from the chat, but before we get to the question for the speakers, I would love to make an announcement that uh, there will be a rewrite, an in-person rewrite for the AEE courses that were taken online. Kindly plug in our WhatsApp broadcast and you'll get the information on where these training, uh, these rewrite is taking place. So we will move forward and uh, take some questions for our speakers. I would love to start with uh, the, speaker, the questions that were shared earlier. We had a question uh, on uh, Miss Rachel, if you are around or James can take that up. How would you rate the implementation rate of the policies discussed? So, uh, Katongole, if I got, I got that right, he is he, asking how would you rate the implementation rate on the policies discussed? James or Rachel can take that up. Well, this is James. Yes. Unfortunately, most of the implementation is already linked to finances. For instance, the electricity connection policy has failed to take off, mainly because of the limited budget. So I think I could say about 50%. Uh, it's uh, because of the limitation of budgets. And then the policies, I think, have been very ambitious. So. It's about 50 percent all right thank you very much for that i hope that has answered the question we have another question on uganda has as well formulated energy policies and regulation but access to energy in the country is still very low what is the significant challenge that limits the implementation of these policies what is the significant challenge that limits the implementation of these policies Okay, the one challenge we have with our population is widely dispersed. So most of the people live in farmlands in the rural areas, and therefore reaching them takes quite a considerable effort. Where we are looking at uh, off-grid solutions as well, but also in addition to grid extension, as well as the mini grids that are being constructed. So the, the biggest limitation is really financing. But also remember that uh, our growth rate is also very high population growth rate. So we, are, we, we because the population is growing very fast, so we have to outcompete 
the population growth rate as well. And that's why a lot of resources have to be now injected into the country, I mean, into the, into the sector. But at the same time, we're looking at the off-grid solutions and that's why solar is now becoming more competitive, especially for those that are far from the grid. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, James. And since you've mentioned the issue on finances, there is someone, Geoffrey Nyasimi is asking, any policy frameworks available in Uganda to attract, to attract climate funds to, to be invested in Uganda's energy sector? Yes, we do have the National Climate Change Policy of 2015 that has to do with the issues of climate change. And this also there is the, the intended national determined contribution where targets have been set to reduce emissions by to about 20, 22%, by 22%. So that is um, also in place that climate funds are also being attracted and they are complementing government resources as well as, as well as private sector financing. Right, thank you very much. And uh, maybe to, to pose some questions for Engineer Fenwick. I love that he has mentioned that uh, for sustainability, we need to go all the way on energy efficiency. And he has mentioned the ESCOs. I would love us maybe to tell us what will these ESCOs benefit the Kenyan energy, uh, energy sector? What do you think are the benefits that will come with this? Okay, uh, fine, Emily. Uh, one, uh, as I said before, before you come up with any policy instrument, there must be a problem you're trying to solve. Uh, that's why there's no policy on how you should uh, be shaving your beards eh, or which clothes should be putting on. Because there's no, the problem has not been identified. So there have to be a problem first to be identified. Uh, this time around, uh, we they did some study on energy efficiency. And we found that, uh, of course, many people would be appreci uh, appreciating energy efficiency, but then it's not a priority for them. Uh, if you worked with factories before, they have a priority in terms of safety, and then they have to improve the output, they have to improve uh, uh, human HR issues. Uh, there's the tax man at their back and there's energy efficiency that they're supposed to implement. Eh? So uh, some appreciate it's a good thing, but they do not have the prioritization to do that kind of work. So if they have to fix their pipeline, their water pipelines, they'll fix that. They, but they'll not fix their compressor because you've said it's not working well. So they will be appreciating that it's working, but uh, they will not. Uh, it's not working well, but they will not have the money uh, to do it. Uh, so when ESCOs come in Kenya, uh, the thing is energy projects will be implemented. And we will leave uh, where we, uh, maybe I say the government and the auditors and everything, we are going to leave the work of energy efficiency totally to ESCOs. So yes, the, the only thing you have to do as a factor is to welcome them into your premise and give them some time to maybe if they want to do retrofit, they do retrofit, and then you enter into a contract. So the only thing you'll be doing is checking your bills. Of course, you have to normalize them to production. And then uh, when you check your bills, you see uh, it's indeed you have reduced uh, the costs of uh, uh, energy. The, the, the difference you pay those guys, you know, when they go away after five years, you still remain with the good or you still remain with the, the, the efficient uh, production. So I've uh, had Uganda mention NDCs. Of course, Kenya, we also have NDCs. Uh, we, we, we are party to that, uh, uh, the, was it COP21 or COP20 uh, uh, for Paris, Paris Accord. So we, as a, national, as a government, we are going to now uh, actually win, win this uh, war using that approach. It's called a uh, bottom up, but it's not the one that uh, we are talking about in Kenya right now. So we take this facility A, B, C, D, we, we, we have the, uh, them assisting us to abate uh, or to, to avoid CO2 and uh, noxious and success. Then of course, a summation will give us our national target. Uh, so that's, that's our bottom up in terms of doing that. And one, one of the ways of implementing that is using the ESCOS, which will, will be very instrumental. Uh, maybe I had to mention about the exemptions. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, according to how the economy is performing, you'll find there are also exemptions for things like LEDs. Eh? 
because they're energy efficient. So when they come into the country, they are exempted by the treasury to do that. So basically, that's what ESCO will assist us. And you see, once you have a facility that has, is uh, generating efficiently, there are, there, there are three things you'd get from that <coughs> energy efficiency. There's something called Jevons paradox, energy efficiency. Uh, someone always asks me, Felix, you want uh, uh, people to be efficient and you say Kenya power success power. So where do you want them to sell the power? So I tell them to go read Jevons paradox, uh, which, which say there are two kinds of rebounds you get in energy efficiency. One is direct rebound, another is direct rebound. So when facilities are uh, efficient, there'll be a rebound. Eh? One is that they're going to produce, the cost of production is going to go low. When there's a low cost of production, they're going to produce more. When they produce more, they consume more electricity, but this time around efficiently. That's one thing. Then two, if the cost of the products go low uh, because of, uh, um, of course, uh, now uh, reduced cost of energy, the costs are going to go to, uh, people are going to buy more or people are going to have uh, extra money in their pockets. Then if I was buying sugar at uh, 20 shillings, uh, then it goes down 15 shillings because of the, uh, I'm not saying sugar, sugar is 20 shillings. Eh? Someone might think I'm, I'm removed from uh, reality. Just being an example. So if you, you buy sugar at 20 shillings, then uh, after the, the, the efficiency, you start buying at 18 shillings uh, uh, per, per quarter. You see you have two more shillings. So where do you take that two more shillings? You buy something else. And when you buy that something else, you increase the aggregate demand. When you increase the aggregate demand, the facilities increase their production output. So when they increase the production output, they are increasing their consumption from Kenya power. That's one thing Then they're increasing they will employ an extra person to, uh, to do that work for them. Eh? And the supply chain is going to increase. So you see, you see the, the effects are a bit big. So that's what you call a uh, Javon's paradox, the importance of uh, energy efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, engineer, for conclusively answering that question. And uh, we have another question for you. Someone is saying we have experienced serious power interruptions here in Kenya due to grid issues. What are the policy, what is the policy being developed to achieve a smart grid? Okay, fine. Uh, of course, uh, uh, because the Kenya Power is uh, an independent entity, they, they do their own stuff as much as the, the, the minister gives them some policies uh, in terms of uh, uh, what they should do. What we do as EAPRA, I'm assuming that question is posed to me as an EPRA guy. Uh, in EPRA, what you do, Kenya Power has, uh, what you call the customer charter, uh, which uh, EPRA assigns, eh? and they're supposed to adhere to that charter. We have the re reliability indicators, um, uh, which uh, uh, they're supposed to, to meet. Uh, of course, uh, those indicators is in terms of blackout. So there's a blackout, how long will it take to restore the, 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 the blackout? It's called KID, SAIFI, MAIFI, and all that. So those indicators, what we, we follow up on with Kenya Power to make sure that they are improving. Uh, the grid has issues, of course, and, and that issue is uh, multifaceted. Um, I'm not talking as uh, the policy guy from the ministry. I've seen a ministry guy, I probably can talk about that in terms of policies in Kenya Power, but it, it, it's multifaceted uh, in that uh, the, the kind of uh, generation is not distributed. Eh? So we distribute power from uh, centralized places. Then we, we try to transmit that power to far flank areas. Like in Western, um, uh, thanks to Uganda, they assist us a lot eh? when we're having issues with power. Uh, but now we've, we've developed another transmission line to that end eh? to assist us to now evacuate enough power to Western. But that's one of the reasons you might be having issues actually uh, in far flank areas because of the voltage drops and all those kind of things. Sometimes you experience national blackouts because the demand in Western has increased and the Uganda has failed to give us power and the line from the, the centralized uh, part of the Republic cannot evacuate enough power that's it. So the line just shuts down uh, because of that. Uh, those are mechanisms of, uh, of course, uh, electrical engineers. When you're introducing me, you say I'm a mechanical engineer. So they'll ask me questions of electrical, uh, which I may not be able to answer well. But that's the reason. Uh, it's because of the grid issues. Eh? Uh, Kenya Power has to improve. Uh, but as they improve, there are two things you need to realize. Uh, they are partly on the National Stock Exchange. So it's, it's partly public, partly government. So as government puts in money for them to improve the infrastructure in terms of smart metering and everything, uh, that money is supposed to pay back. If it doesn't pay back, Kenya Power starts announcing losses. 
If they announce losses, Kenya power goes down. If Kenya power goes down, the whole country goes down. Uh, that's the unfortunate bit. So we need to have a perfect balance. They need to invest in improving the grid, but that takes time. Um, I'm sorry I didn't uh, take some time to talk about natural monopolies. Eh? I, I, I wanted to start uh, from that to bring in the aspect of why we regulate the energy sector. But uh, uh, the energy infrastructure, if you read histories of how US made their grid, China, India, it takes time to improve it uh, slowly. Uh, so smart metering has to, at some stage, uh, come on. Uh, there's supposed to be reconfiguration of the network to make sure that if one line goes off, that one line picks without necessarily affecting everyone. Uh, but that might take time, and I may not uh, give conclusive answers to that. What I, I, I did was just to give a generalized overview of that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, Winfred Mutinda is asking great insight and lecture, Dr. Engineer Felix Mosonye. What are your thoughts on how effective the renewable energy auction policy will be in ensuring the cost competitiveness of renewable power generation? Thank you, Winnie. Uh, I assume that's Winnie, my friend, of course. Uh, what, uh, we, what, 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 actually, if you compare, if, if you compare with FIT, uh, FIT was uh, actually susceptible to manipulation. Eh? Because CFIT, you can wake up there and, and realize you have some solar panels you want to connect the grid. Maybe you can come, I'm, I'm, twist, I'm twist me in the office here. I'm not saying that's what happens, but it might happen. Uh, you never know the kind of leaders you'll get tomorrow. They could be wrong. So you might come and I'm twist me here. Uh, I accept, of course, uh, uh, to take power to the grid when it's not even uh, required. Eh? So you see, you get unsolicited bids from FIT. Uh, in a way, those can disrupt uh, the uh, planning. Eh? But uh, now for auctions, uh, assuming uh, we are operating in an ideal environment, then of course you're going to take the lowest bidder who meets the standards. It should be very easy for, uh, to implement. That will make your work a bit easier. And it's going to also to be subjected to the Public Procurement uh, Act and the procedures in the country. So it's very easy to get uh, people. Then another thing is the government will be very, it will be very easy for the government to say, I want power in uh, County X at point B specifically. So that's the way, the place the government run the power, then you're going to invest there. But as it is for now, the FIT guys, uh, anyone thinks of uh, anywhere you can put that power plant, then he wants to use it to connect the grid. But with the, with the auctions, it will be easy to have what you call, of course, a, a decentralized uh, a distributed generation where now people can put power in, in far flank areas, then they bid for that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, engineer, for those inputs. I can see the chat on the chat. People asking for the email of the of our speakers. We have requested you to join our WhatsApp broadcast. We'll be able to share that information with you. We'll also be able to share the the presentations that we've had today and the recording of this uh, webinar. Also, I would love to. Thank Mr. James for answering the questions. I can see he has answered most of the questions on the chat, and that is very good. We also appreciate Madam Rachel for the presentation and engineer for their kind uh, uh, response to our call and presenting to, on this webinar. So moving forward, I will ask uh, Ruth to share another poll, and then we can proceed and uh, get to the uh, end of this meeting. Kindly share with us the poll and then we can proceed. Karen, kindly share the poll. Uh, this, the poll is up. Which areas of implementation do you foresee shortcoming? And what will in the market adoption? 
visit consumer awareness, lobbying, enforcement of financial investment. Let us take just three minutes to take this poll and then we can proceed to the next item of the meeting. All right, all right. I think uh, all of us have been able to take that. So can we see the results? Kindly share with us the results of the poll. Yes, I can see financial investment has the IS at 66%, enforcement at uh, 41%. I can see consumer awareness at 28%, lobbying at 32%. So this, this means that financial investment in the energy sector is a great deal and we should look at that. And it's a good thing that our, our engineer today has shared with us information about the ESCOs. And just to mention that um, in our next webinar, we have a topic on the ESCOs. And uh, I would love us to plug in, as I've mentioned in our WhatsApp broadcast, and we'll be able to get all this information about that. We can put down there. Moving forward, I would love to announce that uh, we, as the, the World Energy Day Secretariat, are planning to have a successful and amazing conference in Kampala this year, if the world open, opens up. We have great, great speakers lined up for you, but we are announcing that if you are willing to be a speaker and participate in this World Energy Day conference, you can reach out to us on our WhatsApp broadcast or our social media handles, and we'll be able to plug you in in this conference. We also calling for sponsors. If you're willing to sponsor and partner with us in the World Energy Day conference this year, we welcome you to join us and make this event a success. And then I will love to call upon Linda Manyala and talk to us a little bit about uh, the ESCOs and then we can wrap it up. Linda Manyala, kindly welcome. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Emily, for inviting me to speak shortly about ESCOs. I think I won't go so into it because uh, Engineer Phoenix already mentioned so much about it. And uh, yeah, we, we as innovators are currently conducting a project uh, that involves deployment of ESCOs in Kenya. And we will be addressing the barriers to improving energy and water efficiency in Kenya and East Africa, just by increasing capacity, both in the demand and the supply chain, and to be able to develop and implement more projects, organizations to be able to save their energy costs and reduce carbon emissions. So we will be having conversations around this, uh, this coming August. So I have seen on the chat, a few people asking about ESCOs and uh, how they can be involved, like uh, Kofi or say a, a J. I hope I've said that right. <laughs> we'll be having these conversations in August. So kindly look out for that and share it with your networks. In, in our social media platforms, we'll be able to, to inform you on when this will be held. I would also just like to thank uh, everyone for joining us today. It's been a very insight, insightful meeting. And uh, we do see that regulations and policies are very important in the energy sector. And I'm hoping that more energy professionals will be able to tune in and uh, be involved in the development of, of policies in, in their countries. So I would like to thank our speakers for today, uh, starting with Dr. Engineer Fen Fenwix Musonye uh, for the amazing insights. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our other speaker, Rachel Nalule. Thank you so much for taking your time to speak to us today. I also want to thank our partners, uh, including Aria Finergy. Thank you so much for your efforts towards uh, the World Energy Day activities. 
and uh, also UNREA, which is a Uganda National Renewable Energy and, and Energy Efficiency Alliance, and also EPRA for always uh, coming coming through for us when we need uh, to speak on, on, on topics that matter in the energy sector. So this, uh, this has been the fourth uh, Energy Professionals Roundtable, and I'm very, very glad to be a part of it. We hope to see you in the next, in the next uh, meetings. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, Lena, for that. I can see Dalila Amar is saying in the next World Energy Day, I would like to present. Thank you very much for showing that concern. And we, we recognize that. And we ask that you join our WhatsApp broadcast. I know our, our tech team has already shared with you a link on the chat box so that you can join us. You can join the, the WhatsApp broadcast and you'll be able to be updated on all the things World Energy Day. So today, I would love to thank you all for joining this webinar. It has been a very insightful and insightful webinar. I know many people have, sent, have shared their questions on the WhatsApp uh, on the chat. We can see them. And those questions that have not been able to be tackled, we'll be able to tackle that on our WhatsApp broadcast. I can see also Mr. James has also been answering your questions from the chat and the recordings and the, web and the, and the webinar reports will be shared with all of us and you can join us on the WhatsApp broadcast so that you can get more and more information. We are hoping that you will see you on our next webinar, which is on uh, the, this coming month on ESCOs, as Linda has mentioned, it has been a great, great, great uh, webinar, and I appreciate you all for plugging in. Thank you very much for attending, and we have come to the end of this amazing webinar today. I appreciate you all for coming.